Our next speaker is Maor um, Ashkenazi from Ben Gurion University. It's a work with Zohar Rimon, Ron Weinstein, Shir Levy, Elad Richardson, Pinchas Mintz, and Eran Tretzer. Great. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, this is a joint work with a few of my colleagues from work and uh, my advisor, uh, Eran Treister from Ben Gurion University. So um, let's begin with a fast recap of implicit neural representations. Now, I assume that everyone here has uh, some, uh, some, uh, some uh, form of familiarity with neural representation in general, as they gained a lot of popularity in the recent years. Now, the main ideas of these approaches is that we can parameterize a signal using a neural, re using a neural network. This neural network will act as a mapping function uh, from the signal coordinates to the corresponding values at those specific coordinates. Now, as an example, you can look at the figure on the bottom right of the screen, uh, which shows the process of learning a neural representations for videos. Uh, here, a single timestamp coordinate is mapped to the entire pixels of the frame at that spe specific timestamp. Um, on the left, you can see the very popular NERF architecture, where in order to represent a 3D object, we learn a mapping function from a five-valued coordinate system um, that contains the uh, position and direction of a ray to the four values representing the color and the density of the corresponding pixel in the scene. <clears throat> so inspired by these previous works, we aspire to learn neural rep representations for pre-trained neural networks. We call this neural representation NERN. Now, we focus on convolutional neural networks and we model this task as a, map, a mapping function between three-valued coordinate system uh, that contains the layer, filter, and channel indices to the specific values of the corresponding k by k convolutional kernels. After training, after training NERN, one can query it over all possible coordinates uh, to obtain the reconstructed network, which hopefully will be very similar to the original network. Now, this process is uh, visualized in this following figure. We begin by transforming uh, the layer filter and channel indices to the positional embeddings. Using uh, uh, these positional embeddings is a very standard and popular approach uh, that was used in, in many neural representation works. Uh, then these embeddings are fed into NERN, which is a very simple MLP, and we obtain the weights of the corresponding K by K weight kernel, which can then be plugged into the reconstructed network. Uh, now, we use a popular version of the positional embeddings, which I believe was made popular by the, by the uh, attention is all you need paper. Uh, we experimented with some different base frequencies and listed some interesting results in the paper, uh, but I won't go into them today. So, uh, the, the big question here is why would this even work? I mean, I believe that no one here would be surprised if I said that we can successfully predict the weights of a, of a network using a larger predictor network. But creating a compact neural representation is not trivial. The main difference between uh, network weights and natural signals is that weights do not contain any form of uh, inherent smoothness. Uh, they are expected to be unordered and hold very high frequencies. Um, so on the right, we can see a simple natural video taken from NERV, where adjacent frames contain very similar values, both in the spatial and the temporal dimensions. Now on the left, we can see a visualization of the adjacent convolutional kernels of a pre-trained ResNet 18 model, and as expected, we cannot see any smooth patterns in this signal. So uh, in order to mitigate this issue, we would like to introduce a form of smoothness between the weight kernels themselves, and hopefully simplify the task for NERN. Now we examine two methods to promote the smoothness in the weights of the original network. The first is a regularization-based approach, and the second is a post-training permutation to the weights. Before we going into the details, uh, let me just introduce what we denote as the smoothness term. Now there are a lot of symbols here, so I'll break it down. The first summation of the left on the left goes over the layers of the network, and the second and third go over the filters and the channels uh, of a specific layer, respectively. These deltas symbolize the cosine distance between two vectors, and these WLs symbolize the current late layer's uh, weight tensor. Now, the idea is we want to sum up all the cosine distances of adjacent kernels throughout both the filter and the channel dimension. Uh, this basically means we are enforcing smoothness in two dimension, 
in two dimensions and currently ignoring the layer dimension. So in the basic regularization-based approach, uh, we explicitly add this smoothness term to do original network straining. In some sense, we can think about it as we're making the original network aware to the fact that NERN will try to reconstruct it. Uh, sort of uh, a NERN-aware training, um, if you would. Uh, of course, the original network's accuracy is probably slightly degraded due to this constraint, uh, this regularizer. Uh, thus presenting an interesting trade-off between the original network accuracy and NERN's ability to reconstruct it. This is a very basic naive approach, and while conceptually interesting, it requires uh, intervening in the original network uh, training, which we don't really want for a lot of reasons. Uh, for example, we would need the code, we would need the training scheme, uh, the resources needed to, to train the original network. So we wanted to mitigate some of these drawbacks uh, by introducing uh, a permutation-based uh, smoothness approach. Um, and here we apply post-training permutations to the weights. This means that uh, the permutation itself will try and minimize the smoothness, the, the smoothness term in some way. Uh, a key trick here is that we do not permute the weights in the original network itself, uh, but only the order in which the kernels are predicted by NERN. Uh, we formalized this problem using graph theory, but I won't go into the details due to time constraints, but feel free to check out the paper for extended details. So we consider two variants of these permutations, uh, which we call the in-filter and the cross-filter permutations. In the in-filter permutations, uh, we apply two steps. First, we reorder the weight kernels inside their original filter, and then we reorder the entire permuted filters. Uh, the colors of the weights only symbolize the uh, filter from which they came from and not their, origin, uh, their actual values. Um, this basically means that we do not reorder kernels between different filters in a layer. Now, in the cross-filter permutation approach, we add an additional degree of freedom, letting weight kernels move between different filters. Technically, this is implemented by concatenating all of the filters together, permuting the resulting tensor, and then breaking it down uh, to separate filters by just reshaping the tensor. Intuitively, uh, while more expensive, the cross-filter permutations should generate smoother weights. Uh, it is important to know that since um, we use a greedy algorithm to find these permutations, then uh, getting a, a smoother weight uh, is not guaranteed. So now that we know how to inform this, force, this form of uh, uh, smoothness onto our learned signal, let's look at the entire training scheme for NERN. Uh, we have already seen uh, the bottom left part of the pipeline, but now I've added the, the last terms. So we use a combination of three loss terms. The first one is the most basic one, the reconstruction loss between the original and reconstructed weight. This is a simple L2 distance between the weight tensors of the weights. The two other losses are inspired from the field of knowledge distillation. The key intuition uh, for these losses lies in the fact that small modifications or perturbations to a network's weights can propagate errors and result in significant degradation in accuracy. So to mitigate this issue, we want NERN to be aware of, of the activations uh, in addition to the weights. Um, so in every training iteration, what we do is uh, we feed a random batch of images from the data set, and uh, we pass it through to the original and the reconstructed network, and then compare the logits and the feature maps of the two networks. The logits are compared using the standard uh, knowledge distillation loss, which is basically the KL divergence between the logits, and the feature maps are compared using an L2 distance between the, uh, the feature map tensors. Uh, I'll skip the loss term formulas due to the lack of time, but uh, I will show that empirically we can see that the knowledge distillation losses stabilize the training process and allow for a better and also faster convergence. Uh, this is shown in more detail in the paper. So let's talk about some experiments. Uh, we experiment on three classification tasks. Today I'll present uh, the results on CIFAR-10 and ImageNet. For each task, NERN is trained to reconstruct the weights of, a different re of some different uh, ResNet variants. Uh, in the experiments presented here, we use the permutation-based smoothness approach. Uh, in addition, NERN is composed of a five-layer MLP with a fixed hidden size throughout the layers. We do experiment with the hidden size as a way of controlling NERN's capacity, basically its size. So here we show the results for reconstructing ResNet 20, which was trained on CIFAR-10. I'll point your attention to the bottom, of the, to the bottom uh, line of the table, the, the highlighted line, where we can see that uh, a NERN 
of roughly 60%, the size of the, the original network is able to reconstruct the original network quite well and achieve uh, basically comparable results. Uh, this is, the same trends can actually also be seen for ResNet 56 on CIFAR 10. Now going forward to ImageNet, uh, I would like to point, point out that we did not train the original network on ImageNet, but instead used the pre-trained ResNet 18 version from TorchVision. This shows the flexibility of the permutation-based smoothness and our method in general. Here we can see that NERN is of roughly 50% the size of the original network and is able to reconstruct uh, the original network quite well uh, with only a 0.8% drop in top one accuracy and an even lower drop on top uh, five accuracy. We additionally ex uh, experimented with reconstructing a relatively compact network, specifically we worked on SqueezeNet. Uh, these results are not yet available in the preprint, but were part of our rebuttal comments, so uh, it can, they can be seen on open review. Uh, the fact that NERN can successfully reconstruct a compact network is a strong indication that our proposed NERN can be used on various architectures. So finally, we get to the long-awaited questions. Um, we know that it works. We know that NERN can successfully represent the weights of a neural network, but what can we actually do with it? So there are a few active research directions that we are, we are pursuing for NERN. Uh, we listed two of them in the paper, uh, and I'll briefly present one of them here. Uh, we can generally use NERN for weight importance analysis. Uh, the key idea here is that limited capacity NERN must implicitly prioritize the weights of the original network. This is also encouraged by the knowledge distillation losses, uh, since NERN has to consider the activations themselves and not just the weights. This means that the reconstruction error of filters can be used as a measure of weight importance. Uh, the proposed measure, measure is also true in a global sense which means we can compare filters from different layers, uh, which is a difficult task in itself. <clears throat> Here you can see a, a visualization that gives intuition to this observation. Um, in a specific layer of ResNet 18, we compare the activations that are ob obtained uh, from filters uh, with a low reconstruction error uh, to filters with a high reconstruction error. And we can clearly see that the low error filters provide high activations that correlate to semantically important features in the input image, as opposed to the high error filters which do not. Uh, I would like to thank you for listening, and the preprint and code are available now on Archive and GitHub. Thank you. Thank you, Maor. We have some time for questions. Please raise your hand. Uh, so I have uh, one question. Uh, can this, uh, it looked like uh, you use this uh, network uh, mostly for compression, and can this be used, uh, I don't know, for interpolating the network? For example, if you have, uh, you want a network with a different number of, uh, different kernel size or yeah. different number of layers, so can you do that? Did so you try that? First, let me say that's a, a very interesting direction, and, um, I like, I like this question because we actually tried it. I mean, this is an open direction that we do want to explore further. Uh, we didn't add it to the paper because we didn't um, get uh, promising results from a very trivial attempt at this, but we do believe there, there is something there. I mean, the idea, um, what NERFs brought to the table was the fact that you can interpolate, right, the coordinates that you didn't see during the training and, and achieve novel views. So one of the things we do want to, to you know, uh, do in the future is try and find out how we can use uh, interpolations to, to generate uh, maybe new or, uh, you know, different networks of some kind. Thank you. Other questions? So uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you.